Can uh, everybody hear me all right? Great, thank you. Um, this is, I want to do this a bit more informally because this is, this is uh, intended to be a, a workshop and a conversation with yourselves around the uh, future strategy for the UUK Guild HE Code of Practice. Um, so you will be invited to do some work in a little while, but I just want to uh, do a few, um, a bit more of an introduction in terms of what's been happening uh, since uh, May, since I became the, the chair of the Governance Board, um, just to bring you up to speed on some of the changes that have been made uh, with the code of practice, some of the people involved, uh, and then we'll get on to you know, the exciting bit about the, uh, what we intend to do with the code, certainly over the next uh, three to five years. So, um, so I'll give you an update on uh, code development, uh, present the vision and mission that has been worked up with the uh, Governance Board and, and uh, colleagues from the Sector Advisory Group. Um, we're going to discuss the draft strategic plan for the UUK Guild HE Code of Practice, um, look at some of the themes that are emerging in that strategic plan, and then give you a chance to discuss that in small groups, which is a bit of a challenge in this kind of environment, but we'll see how we go. Um, I'm also interested to hear from those of you that are listening in online as well. Um, so then there'll be a chance for some uh, feedback at the end of the uh, at the end of the 50-minute uh, session, so we can hear from you your views on on what's been presented uh, today. This won't be the only time you can uh, feedback, um, and in particular the workshop this afternoon, which uh, Faye will be leading on, who's Faye Sherrington, who's the chair of the Sector Advisory Group. It was a wave, show, uh, Faye. Um, Faye will be leading on an work, interactive workshop around the review of the code, which is part of our strategic uh, plan. So, going back to May uh, 2022, um, I was appointed as chair of the Governance Board. Um, now, my predecessor, uh, Andrew Nightingale, who sadly uh, passed away early on this, uh, this year, Andrew, working with you, UK, commissioned a review, administrative review, of all the administrative arrangements uh, on the members' behalf for the code of uh, practice. And that review was very comprehensive and uh, came up with 14 key recommendations. Now, I'm not going to go through all of those. You'll be pleased to hear, but in, in kind of summary form, um, there was uh, established a revised appointment process, both for my role as chair of the governance board and for Faye's role as chair of the sector advisory group. So those arrangements were put in place together with um, an arrangement for the appointment of uh, deputies, so we've got Robin Walsh, who was the deputy of the Governance Board, and Mel, and I've forgotten Mel's surname, Parrot, Mel Parrot uh, from Oxford. Uh, she's the deputy for the Sector Advisory Group. Um, the location of the uh, Code of Practice, so it's been, uh, the administration of the Code has been, has, has several kind of versions of it, as I mentioned earlier in my speech. I was responsible for administering the code for its first seven years, and I think then it went to Newcastle University, and I'll lose track then where it went to after that, but it ended up uh, with Kubo in a kind of informal arrangement. So Universities UK and Guild HE sent out a tender for the administrative arrangements for the code, and very pleased to report that Kubo were, we are won, that, uh, won that tender. Um, and have now been confirmed with a memorandum of understanding between Kubo and Universities UK on the, the administrative uh, duties for the code of practice. So that's, that's a great step forward. So the certainty in terms of where does the code administration sit, how much does it cost, and uh, what, what's its role and responsibilities uh, to the Governance Board and the Sector Advisory Group. Uh, another recommendation was that the terms of reference for both groups, the Governance Board and Sector Advice Group, should be strengthened. Uh, um, a list of delegated uh, responsibilities in terms of decision making has been established for each of the groups and so revised terms of reference and membership. So um, that's been a, quite a big, big piece of work and they were all recently signed off uh, at the last uh, Governance Board. And then the final one that's important to yourselves is the development of a strategic plan uh, that would underpin how the code is going to develop. So not being, it's, it's not a criticism, it's just how things have been that, and even in my time, we just kind of worked one, one year to the next in terms of delivering what was required. Whereas I think now there needs to be more strategic approach in terms of how can the code develop, what kind of support do members need, 
uh, what kind of work can we do in terms of research uh, that can help uh, us understand how the implications and impact of the of the code so on the 20th of July um, I chaired my first governance board but prior to that we had about a 90 minute workshop where we uh, working with colleagues we established a vision and mission which I'm going to uh, show you in, in, in a second um, and then from that um, on the 11th of October this year we had a similar workshop before a governance board meeting uh, to look at the strategic plan um, we, we did it in a workshop format um, so lots of uh, feedback uh, into that process and you'll see the results of that in a short while so I think that's kind of the the background um, I suppose has anybody got any immediate burning questions on on anything that I've just said in the introduction before we get into the nitty-gritty cool right so the uh, the vision so I'll stand up for this so I can uh, read it so we've established a vision uh, for the uh, code of practice actually it might be easier if I read it over here so why does the code exist really is, is the is, is, is the question and the code is here to uh, protect and support students in university owned or managed uh, residential accommodation making an important contribution to the broader student experience as well as to assure local authorities and other stakeholders that such accommodation is meeting legal requirements and standards set by the code so big debating point about its contribution to the wider student experience but the overriding feedback that we had from colleagues was that yes it does it's in, you know the residential experience is such a key part of the whole student experience you can't divorce it and I think uh, Edward in his presentation this morning made it very clear you know the important role that student accommodation has in that whole student experience so um, whilst it may be contentious we I still think it's the right thing for us to be saying that you know, we are an important part and the code plays an important part in um, in the uh, student experience and then we look into the local authorities because you know they have to um, you know if, if we weren't complying if a university was not compliant with the code and as a result of that we withdrawn from membership then the local authorities would then take on in terms of local licensing arrangements and you will all be aware those of the huge costs that that could incur for an institution and they do vary you know across uh, the country depending on lo location um, but we also meet, need to meet the legal requirements that set out in the code it's part of the uh, housing act of 2004 i'm really pleased to say that the department of i think it's leveling up in local communities or the other way around it keeps changing um, they've been really actively involved they're involved in both workshops and, and William who's there who's the key contact there I say has been uh, really making some important contributions to that ultimately you know, we have to report to that department you know, on how the code is performing and we produce that annual report that demonstrates how we are giving assurance to the government that universities are, are compliant so that's our vision And this really is how will the code help deliver that vision well the code is here it's to support yourselves and universities and their students in the delivery of that outstanding accommodation experience and to assure students and other stakeholders of compliance with the standards so that three yearly audit cycle is there to give uh, independent assurance you know, to the university's governing bodies to the department of leveling up in local communities uh, to UUK and Guild HE that we are complying uh, with that with the uh, with the code and the standards Oops. so we then developed the mission statement what are we about in terms of delivering that uh, the vision and so we're going to we're going to deliver that vision through the provision of high quality residential experience that's safe for our students it's secure it's sustainable and I'll come back to that in a second and it's supportive throughout their stay students because of all those things that are surrounding them in their experience, residential experience they're enabled to focus on you know what's really important which is making a positive contribution to the academic the social and the local communities that they're living in 
So it's freeing up students. They're not having to worry about, you know, if they can afford the heating, whether the heating is actually going to be on, the lighting, the security, the safe, safety of that accommodation. Uh, so that's our mission. Sustainable uh, raised a few kind of queries. You know, are we stepping into um, kind of territory beyond the code? But it's, it's certainly an important issue. Uh, we need students to engage in that sustainability agenda in their accommodation. I think Martin likely alluded to that, you know, our, our students, uh, I think it was a bit derogatory actually, I think students are very conscious about the, uh, the um, uh, energy and, and costs. But at the moment the code is, uh, talks about uh, recycling facilities, you know, you know, should we, and this is something that they will explore uh, through the, uh, the review of the code, is you know, how do we extend that and, and where, where does that go? So there's some opportunities there in terms of delivering uh, the mission. So I keep going back over there. And then how will the code deliver on the mission? So it, we will do that through the monitoring of how universities uh, meet the code requirements uh, and support university teams in sharing good practice. So there's more work we can do to help you uh, meet the standards of the code uh, by sharing good practice and this is an example you know kind of how we can uh, encourage uh, networking and then we have the practitioners conference um, as well uh, but sharing that good practice and how you deliver your obligations to the code uh, the efficiency of how you do that the sustainability uh, of that uh, as well So that's the vision and mission. Uh, we've got some handouts that are on the way, so we'll be able to uh, share those with you, but you've also got it electronically, I think, already in the, in the presentation. So having established those and got approval for those vision and mission statements, we then started to work on the strategic plan. As I say, in July this year, we held a workshop and we came up with these three strategic themes, uh, engagement and partnerships, standards, people and systems, and finance and results. So we'll go through each of these, but the first one, um, the first kind of thematic uh, area we're working on is delivering dynamic membership engagement and stakeholder partnerships. So how can we improve the connectivity with yourselves as members of the code? Uh, and also how can we work more closely with uh, other partners that impact on the code? Um, so, for example, you know, the policy work within Universities UK and Guild HE that will have an impact uh, on the uh, review of the code. And we've heard, say, a bit about that uh, this morning, some opportunities there. Um, so, yeah, the code is very much your code, but we need to uh, kind of improve the level of engagement and, and feedback. Um, and some of the arrangements, you know, that, that Trudy, who's our new administrator, um, you know, Trudy's working really hard on things like you know, the software tools that you've got available and how you do the submissions and making that more user-friendly. That's another way in which we can improve the engagement. Uh, standards, people and systems to ensure that the code remains relevant and delivers consistently for all of you. And then finally, uh, to deliver targeted resources for the delivery of the code. So, You'll see in a, in a little while we're doing a lot of work on the financial sustainability of the code and how we measure and report back to you in our annual report about the, the, uh, how well uh, we're performing and what the impact has been. So final three, uh, three slides. So we break those, we've broken those themes down into uh, some objectives. So the first one under engagement part partnership. So we've got to raise awareness of the code both with members uh, with the broader professional services colleagues in the university because you, know, you can't do this all on your own. You need an effective estates and maintenance department. Uh, you need support from student support. Um, so there's, you're not, you know, as residential managers, delivering uh, for the, the code. You can't do this on your own. We've recently written to all the heads of institutions laying out the institution's responsibilities and encouraging vice-chancellors to talk to their heads of professional services around their responsibilities to support you in delivering you know, those, um, the, uh, the standards to the code. 
Second one is delivering an analysis of stakeholders for the code. So who do we need to engage with? How do we need to engage with them? What do they need from us? What do we need from them? So we don't have a stakeholder map at the moment, um, but we need to develop one so that we can, for example, understand the work that's going on in the sector, like Edward's doing on, on uh, sharing of information and how that then impacts on the code. Um, and we'll need a plan in terms of how we deliver that. And then thirdly, uh, research the levels of awareness and impact of the code across members and students. So again, structured research that tells us you know, the effectiveness of the work that we're doing, how we're communicating the code and the levels of awareness uh, with students, with parents, etc. So there, that's the breakdown of the first strategic theme. On the second one, on standards, systems and people. So identifying best practice case, case studies from yourself so we can publish those on the, on the website and make it a very useful tool for people to, to be able to uh, access. Creating an online uh, code presence for the sharing of best practice, so kind of a forum where you can share and, and you, you may have had an audit with a particular challenge about a non-mandatory element and how might you respond to that in terms of the management action. So you could perhaps go out to the uh, message board specifically on that. Um, training materials, because whilst there is a requirement in the standards for training, it's not very well audited at the moment. So again, something that we'll be looking at in the review of the code, but also providing and supporting you with materials online for your residential staff to access. So they're raising the awareness of what the code is about. Um, and a, a more comprehensive, frequently asked questions, uh, um, information on the, on the website. Um, biggest one, I think, is going to be the undertaking of a review of the code, which Faye will be leading on, um, the consultation with yourselves and other stakeholders on that, um, and then ultimately going back into Parliament to gain legislative approval for that revised code of, uh, code of practice. And the final one in here is uh, undertaking a five yearly review. So we've, we've undertaken, you know, you UK Guild H, you've undertaken a review. We shouldn't sit back on our laurels. We should be coming back in five years time and doing another review, making sure that everything is still fit for purpose, that we're meeting the requirements um, and look at that continuous improvement cycle for the code. Final one, uh, strategic theme three, finance and resources. So it would be really good to have a five-year financial plan. We don't have one at the moment. We have a, a yearly budget, and then we, we monitor against that budget. But it makes it very difficult for the sector advisory group to plan ahead in terms of what promotional campaigns do we need, what can we afford, where's the gap analysis between the work that needs to be done by the code and its ability to finance it. So very conscious that price is really sensitive. Um, the increase in the price that we've just put through will help some of the funding of the forward plan, but we really don't have a clear idea yet what, what the five-year investment plan might look like for the code. So that's a piece of work that will come out of the, the approval of this uh, strategy, but also the work that Faye's doing on the review of the, of the code. And then we'd have to, we need to identify and then monitor the key business results so we can be accountable to you as our members we can be accountable to EU, UK, Guild, HE, and ultimately to the government for the performance of the code and giving that reassurance that we're meeting the, uh, the standards set out. So that's a very whistle-stop of the draft strategic plan. Um, there's now an opportunity for you to kind of come together in, in smaller groups and maybe of three or four people uh, and just discuss what I've just said. And we've got some handouts coming so you can, can look at those or access them on your laptops or phones. So in five years' time, if we do all of those things, what will the student experience look like um, and your experience look like in terms of being a member of the code? Um, so that's really looking horizon, kind of looking forward, saying, well, what, what would it be in five years' time? How will it feel? Um, so what would the student experience be like? What other choices do we have that might create even greater possibilities for the impact on the code that we might have missed and do you think the strategy that i've just spelt out actually relates to the vision and is there anything else we can do to align it even more more closely 
So we're bang on time at 12 o'clock, or just after 12 o'clock. So I'm going to give you uh, perhaps 20 minutes to work in groups of three or four, or pairs, or if it's up to you, not being prescriptive, just to talk about what I've just gone through, uh, any questions, any suggestions, uh, and then we'll take feedback uh, at the end of that. So we give you till uh, just after 20 past 12. We're due to finish at half past 12 for lunch, so I don't want to keep you from that. Um, but let's have 20 minutes of uh, discussion uh, amongst yourselves. Thank you.
Hello. Oh, we're back on. Um, right, so we're going to move on to um, any particular comments, questions, suggestions. Um, I've got Trudy over here who's going to scribble away, and Robin has volunteered as well. <laughs> um, so we'll capture this. Um, we'll feed anything, you know, all your feedback into the final version of the uh, strategic uh, plan and the narrative that goes behind it. Um, and then we're hoping to get this signed off electronically with the sector advisory group and the governance board before before Christmas, which then means yeah, we've got a clear shot then from 2023 to, to crack on with, uh, with the work in hand. So um, I, I'm not going to go you know, feedback. You just stick your hand up if you've got anything uh, specific to say and we'll, we'll, we'll go around the room. Or shall I force? Thanks. Oh, do you want the... Um, better give you this, Hunter. You can shout. Yeah, shout if you want. Yeah, okay. Yeah, just for the people at the back. There you go. Can you hear me better now? <laughs> so we talked about some uh, major changes coming to the code in the next sort of five years, potentially being a lot broader and involving private providers. Um, we talked about um, the, the large amount of uh, private providers providing university accommodation on campus and how that might feed into the policy. Um, we also questioned the existence of the code in the next five years and whether um, it would drastically change or potentially merge with one of the other codes. Um, but what the overall sort of aim of it in the next five years is that we'd like it to be a lot clearer um, and a lot more understood by the students because at the moment I think um, in comparison to the national code it's not as well understood. Um, and I think that the, the last question, um, the answer to that was uh, we need to focus more on the students and their well-being rather than um, university versus university and competition within the market because right now there isn't sufficient competition and that's driving down standards. Thank you, John. Thanks for some interesting uh, comments there. I suppose uh, one question coming, coming back to you as the members is um, where's, where does the responsibility lie for communicating with students about the code? You know, I mean, is it a case of just providing materials and you kind of as you do at the moment, draw them down from the website and do your own thing. What about prospective students? Because obviously that's really one of the key audiences in terms of reassuring parents and prospective students about the, what the experience was going to be like as well. So there's some big questions there. I'm, say I'm going to give you the answers, but something that we'll need to explore as we, as we move into the um, development of the implementation of the strategy. Robin, you want to say something on that? Um, Yep, I, I think, yeah, I think to, just from our group, just talking about that, it was interesting actually, because we, we, we did um, initially talk about really great idea to have that financial plan in place. I think that will be, that will give some real robustness and some assurances about um, what, what the code is doing and how it's, how it's affording to do that. <coughs> so that was the first kind of comment. Um, so we like that. And then we started to talk about the engagement um, um, element of it. And we actually, end, we did, talk about the students um, and and we questioned actually whether because for years and years we've I think uh, it's been talked about a lot that you know we want students to be able to at any point we could go up to them and say excuse me do you know about the code and they go oh yes and like they would tell us you know every section of the code and how it, how it benefits them but the you know I think universities have worked pretty hard I think more some than others um, but you know it's, it's all over the website now it's in it's in you know on you know e-inductions you know um, certainly within our e-induction it's got its own page and they have to tick that page to say that they've read and understood what the code is and then we we ask them at the end of the year do they know what the code is no one knows what the code is so so then the question was well, does that matter as long as the member is meeting or even exceeding the requirements of the code. So when it is important for the student, when something, when service falls down, the, the code is there 
being picked up um, and the students are, are getting the support. They don't need to know about the code. However, the people who do need to do it, so we, then we talked about who, are the, who, are the, who would be the priority stakeholders that we would want to know more about the code. And I think the first, the first um, uh, people were parents. We thought really important for parents, particularly in that sort of when they're attending open days, um, as they're, a, you know, it's a reassurance to the parents that the students, so they understand that kind of quality mark um, um, concept. Um, and then we talked about, um, uh, who else did we talk Oh, oh the, the auditors, actually. We took, again, lots of conversations I've had around um, with, with, with members of the code around going through the audit process and the struggles and the tribulations that they have of dealing with the auditors. Um, and this kind of feedback that actually the auditors that get put onto these jobs are sometimes the junior members of these very professional audit teams. Um, it's not really seen, you know. So, so actually, maybe it's the. It, the auditors are a priority stakeholder that we need to be um, engaging with and providing those, if they are junior auditors, then maybe there's something there around kind of what information they get, some training around actually how to conduct a, a, an, an audit in order that everybody's audits are a bit more consistent. Is there anything else? I think that's, that's really helpful. I think, Paul, you wanted to come in. Thank you. Uh, Paul from the University of Manchester. Just to pick up on Robin's point about the need for students to know about the code, I don't think there really is, in the way that I couldn't quote a single thing about APTA, but I wouldn't book with a travel agent that wasn't APTA covered or had that logo. I know that's important, and I'll find out when I need it, what I'm allowed. And similarly, with the, uh, with the Financial Services Authority, couldn't quote a thing about what... They do. I just know it's important, and I think it's, as long as students know the code is something important, I think over time um, that's where it needs to be. In our group, we mentioned, um, <coughs> I think it's important, it may vary from institution to institution whether the code is seen as something that is purely about compliance or whether, in addition to that, it's seen as something about driving up standards, which, uh, if I dare summarise the group, I think the latter point was where we agreed, I think, that we would see it as both uh, meeting. So that yeah, and then we should aspire to, to uh, go over that. Yeah. yeah. And I think the final point I'll make is just a practical thing in terms of where we'll be like to see ourselves in five years' time. I think this could be sooner than five years. I would like to see... Um, some kind of online forum, for want of a better word, where we could contribute, where the code would, for example, I just, I'll go on and I haven't got a clue what 2.4 of the code is, I don't know what issues are, and I would see people's comments over time as, when we were doing our audit, we had a problem with this, I think, oh, that's important, or it might be, and when we do the audit, we go section by section, and that I think a discussion forum where people can comment section by section, we've had these problems, can anyone advise? I'm fortunate enough that my colleague Tracy, who helps with the code and manages the code, has been doing it for years. Uh, if she left and we had a new starter, it would be really a really valuable resource, as it would, I think it would for any institution. When, and if you're doing it every three years, and so there's a very good chance you'll have a new starter, or someone who's not dealt with it before, they should just be able to go on and say, right, this is an issue, and this is how that institution has dealt with it, and that institution has. And if they haven't, pose a question. I'll leave it at that. Any other comments? Yeah. Yeah, ours was exactly the same. We spent a lot of time talking about, is this about stopping you from falling to the bottom or is this about you rising up and being able to learn and aspire and continuous improvement? You know, so it should be, look, you passed, but have you considered X, Y, Z, good practice in the sector that actually could move you ahead? You know, it might not be something that your organization has set up to be able to do, you know, because they're all different. But, you know, there are these good things that people are up to and it can all be done anonymously. And it is basically about sharing good practice, but it's also 
trying to formalize that into what good really looks like you know because yeah there's a thing about sharing but there is also something about formal you know formally these are the things that we as organizations aspire to thank you so there's quite a strong feeling there about the aspirational elements of the of the care but also think yeah, you know, there needs to be clarity about what is mandatory and uh, what is aspirational and, and how you know, the language that we use in the cow to make it very clear to the auditors uh, in terms of how they have to you know, respond and find the evidence uh, for those. One of the challenges we had uh, going back at the very beginning, back in 2006, seven was there was lots of musts, can, uh, there wasn't a lot of shoulds and um, you know, auditors were saying like this is really difficult to audit which is why we did the review of the code very quickly in 2009 to get more clarity on, on what's required but I think you know, the time's moved on since then and there's a lot more clarity that we can provide and things that we want to add in into the review that uh, that we'll be talking about this afternoon so it's bang on half past 12 um, just one more slide just to say if you've not said what you wanted to say you've still got chance because you can email uukcop at cubo.ac.uk uh, and send in your feedback to trudy uh, and we'll make sure all that gets uh, gets fed into the discussion when we take the final version out uh, for sign off um, later on this uh, this year but thank you very much indeed for your for your time and uh, enjoy your lunch and uh, we'll see you this afternoon at the workshop when we start to look at the review of the code so more conversations to be had then thank you